We're going to call the local control board to order. For those of you that haven't seen the agenda, we have three different boards we're going to call to order tonight. Um, the first is the local control board, which is for cannabis sales. Um, and first up is public comment. So this would be comment on anything for the local control board that's not on the agenda. I don't know if this would be, I mean, I am the owner. Um, yeah, we're going to get to you. You're okay, on the agenda. Just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you are the agenda. You're the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> I'm this part of the agenda. Yeah. You're good. I will keep my mouth shut. Uh, so, to. seeing nothing, then we'll move on to approval is of the agenda. Trini, is this time for comments for the school select board? Yep, no. if you want to talk well, about the local no, 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 control no, no. board no, 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 for no, no, cannabis. Yeah. No. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Sorry. We'll go through this again when we do the liquor control board. But, yeah. um, so next up is approval of the agenda. Motion to approve the agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Pat up there somewhere. Yeah, he just popped back on. He's so. retrying. Is he with us? Yep. <laughs> so consider retail cannabis license for Polestar Cannabis. So this is our maiden voyage of this process, and we are on the front end, I think. Um, in terms of, there's just is, there aren't a lot of reps statewide in municipalities. In terms of how many times people have done this. Um, in the summer, you voted to form a local control board. That's what you're convened as. This is so that you can consider the license. You could condition approval on any local bylaws. That might be one of those things that we see in renewal periods. I mean, we're thinking it's going to function a lot like a liquor license would. That's what the guidance seems to suggest. That's what some of the practices in other municipalities seems to suggest. Some of the wrinkles are different in terms of how the applications flow to us and what's included in this. So we got in, we've been, Mark in particular, who's ill and not able to be with us tonight, um, was working with the Cannabis Control Board to try to figure out sort of how this flow would go. What we heard from them yesterday um, we got uh, a note that they have not yet approved this. We're tied together. They won't approve it until we approve it. We need a formal referral from the Cannabis Control Board is how we're understanding it. We were seeking clarity if that was what this process was or if there was some other sort of formal referral. The applicant is Polestar Cannabis. Um, John Erdman, who introduced himself a little while ago, is the proposed owner. Um, I guess the applications... Um, the address of the establishment is not public information is what I'm seeing in the, um, in the email from the CCB. Um, and so really you could consider this like you would consider a liquor license as just a retail license only. We could ask the applicant any of the details of the business. We don't have much more from the CCB. Because if you remember with liquor licenses, they kind of, somebody fills them out, they almost flow to the liquor control department at the state level, back through the clerk to you. You make a decision as the control board. We get it back to the clerk who then gets it back to DLC, and there's a chain of information that kind of flows to and fro. fro. And we just to and fro. <laughs> to and fro. Um, but we don't have that for this, and I don't know if that's how this process is going to be different or it's just part of working out the kinks. So I guess the question before you is, you, do you want to consider it, issue some kind of approval, conditional on formal referral, preliminary determination, wait and take formal action, I guess your next or a meeting in, in January would be next. I don't know how that ties into so, some of the other planning. So what comes first, the chicken or the egg? In other words, is the referral is the referral the cannabis boards signing off? I mean, you, you know what I'm saying? I, it's not clear to me what the distinction is. We have two boards, right? We have a state board mm -hmm. and we have a local board. Right. So when you're talking about things, you've been following through. Those are things that are coming from the state level. Yeah. Okay. We're going with you. But with liquor licenses, customarily they get approved at the local level and then processed at the state level. Is, are you saying this situation is reversed or is it similar? Based on what I'm seeing here from the, the folks at the Cannabis Control Board, they'll take the application in, do all of the initial assessments, analysis, look for compliance with anything that's relevant, and then they make a formal referral to us. At that point, we get a redacted version of the application to consider. Is how we're understanding this will flow. You'll convene as the local control board, consider that, see if you want to condition it on anything. When we say local ordinance, we're probably not talking about zoning. Um, we're talking about things if we had a noise ordinance, if there was some sort of loitering issue, if there was some sort of other kind of um, 
uh, that broader ordinance authority umbrella. Um, and then you would make a decision whether or not you approve it, and then it goes back to the state for that final approval to begin operating as a retailer. That's how I've understood it when it's been explained to me. Mm -hmm. However, if anyone else has a deeper understanding. Well, what do we have in zoning for this? <clears throat> this was going to the Planning Commission, I thought, to identify areas and whatnot. So Oops, at sorry. some point, it seems like we got to have an address or something to be able to say it's well, in the, compliance with that. Well, right? there is an address on their website, interestingly. Yeah, enough. I don't know. Yeah. Happy okay. Well, hmm? So I'm happy to provide it if that. 24 plus. 24 plus. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. from so, my recollection of the conversation with the Planning Commission about this, okay, you cannot limit this any different than you would any other business that's a retail establishment. So, if a retail is allowed here, this is this is follows the same guidelines. You can't mm -hmm. pick and choose. But isn't there in the statute they can't be mm -hmm. near a school or different well, things like that? On a local that? level, that may I mean on a statewide level, that may be part of the requirements. So yeah, that flows from so, the statewide stuff. So there's a buffer zone around the school. So this map that's up on the, the TV screens here in the room with us, you can see the two different school areas. And then this red line that goes around it represents that buffer zone there. And then if we're at 24 Pleasant Street, we're down over here. Right. So it's outside that buffer zone. So do they consider, I, I, do they consider like the the daycare at Gifford to be a place they have to stay around away from or are they those kids young enough they're not worried about that type of thing did they restrict it just to schools I think I'm it's just K, wondering how I think we it's get, K through 12 I think yeah yes, I don't have because I know they have a preschool there I remember, but. if I remember correctly it was around the school areas and that red line that Trevor's put up there is what I recall so it's public seeing. schools mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But other than that, you know, I mean, if you have a retail district, that's it's there, whatever it's is it, whatever's in the zoning ordinances, this applies to. Um, there is a, whatever the I'm not sure it's not commercial group services, it was something else. It's just like a retail component. Right. So wherever you allow that, you you allow this. That's been my understanding of the zoning. You can't discriminate. Yeah. In, in, from this versus any other type. So what is the role of the local? control board like if everything's yeah. decided at the state level and by zoning <coughs> are, we, are we doing like we're just here in case they're a nuisance to not renew them like I, we do some of the liquor I think so stuff. I think it's almost that you're putting a flag in the ground for later should you need it and so that think about how you use your authority I mean because in the liquor control situation you have a similar amount of authority or lack there however you want to look at it um, but if we had a seller who was a there was some sort of nuisance component that might come into account mm -hmm. before you got into license renewal in that case because right. you'd have to know their problem. Underage sales, frequent yeah. bar fights, whatever <laughs> it might be. Well, we had the, yeah. the noise and the red line in and all that mm -hmm. issue yeah. for a few yeah, years. Right, right. Well, the sidewalk. That, that was our, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was our time to deal with that was with the outside consumption permits and whatnot. Yeah. And it may also dictate, you know, if you have issues, it may dictate the shape of any ordinance to, to come in and I think there are some state prohibitions in there about where you can use cannabis products um, so that if we have issues in a public space those things might work together but really we're likely talking about a renewal scenario because we don't have any thing of a data set for retail cannabis to say this worked in the past or this didn't or this is the potential pitfall it's we almost have to assume it's like the liquor license application that follows. It's a retail operation. People are going to enter, purchase, leave, and, and mm -hmm. hopefully do, use responsibly somewhere else. Do you know if, I uh, asked this to the proprietor, sure. do you know if there is a, or maybe you know, Trevor, um, is there an inspection system that's up? Uh, in other words, liquor control board representatives can walk in and um, they can come in with somebody who may or may not be <coughs> underage and may or may not have false ID, and then they nail the proprietor for selling to underage or whatever. Do you know if that system is in, in place? Um, absolutely. Uh, yeah. In fact, um, I've, I've contracted with um, a company called Green Path, and they are training 
and uh, you know, in their training, it, it, it yeah. repeatedly says that at any time the CCB can send people unannounced, um, probably just like the liquor scenario, which I'm not familiar with. Uh, but at, at any time they can come, and uh, you know, one of the reasons I'm here tonight. I mean, shame on me. I, I it was through discussions because um, my my application. My understanding was my application was complete, and it's a pretty arduous process to get all the information they want. And the last step is is a site visit from somebody. So I was calling and trying to contact somebody um, to see when we could get that scheduled. And it was in that conversation with the director of licensing at the CCB. She said, well, does, does Randolph have a local control board? And I said, well, I'm, I don't think so. I think I would have heard about that. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, you do, or you you had said that you would, which is great, and I'm mm -hmm. happy to be here. Um, but so my my site inspection for the licensing process is happening this Monday, and and that was sort of to me like the last big step. And then then they, the inspector makes a recommendation, and they could theoretically approve at the state level the issuing of the license at their next meeting. Um, which is on the 14th next Wednesday. They meet every Wednesday and mm -hmm. approve licenses. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's kind of how it went. And, uh, and um, then I got in touch with Mark, and uh, he said, we to come to the meeting. And, and, and they have your security plan already before them, and that kind of thing? Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've yeah. been through, followed this process with someone else that I know. And OK. Just, so I kind of know what you're going. <laughs> yes, uh, sophisticated security system, um, you know, cameras, mm -hmm. interior, exterior, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, obviously, yeah, yeah, alarm yeah. system, right. Um, right. sensors everywhere. Uh, so it's a, it's a very secure building at this point, or at least, you know, my, our, my space. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it is, uh, you know, it is a shared floor um, between. Um, the yoga studio and movement of all. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, but they, I would say, or I'd say everybody's pretty well protected now. Mm -hmm. um, anything that happened <laughs> at either exterior door is going to be, you know, 30 days. You have to retain the footage. So you know, obviously, I've yeah. complied with all of the specifications. Um, I've been working with my cannabis solutions, the attorneys, and. Mm -hmm. in uh, in Burlington to try to make sure I didn't <laughs> leave any yeah. stones unturned yeah. but but here I am because I didn't know about this stuff but uh, you know I'm I'm excited to be in the town and get to know people and um, so here I am it sounds like we're just in the same process as liquor control so yeah. it's a you know and I don't believe I've heard anything that gives us a reason to not award it but that there isn't anything that's come up in this process today where we say we have an issue with so the motion you're recommending is contingent upon cannabis board approval it might be what we do is um, if you're comfortable enough and it's one of those things where you'd approve it tonight or you'd approve it later maybe take the motion to approve the license tonight and if it has to be after a formal referral we'll just we'll come back and so, you'll have to do it then right. well, it sounds like he needs this but it might for be, them to move forward. If this unlocks the rest of the process, at least we've covered that. If for some reason they got to come back, then so I'll we'll make them. We'll be better at it next time. I'll make a motion that we approve <laughs> the the, um, uh, the, the control board approve the license for um, Polestar cannabis contingent upon um, completion of the referral process from the cannabis control board. Thank you. Nice. Second that. Really appreciate it. First a motion and a second conversation. I have one question. I mean, what he's putting together, I know is going to be a good, secure thing in everything else. You talk about this outline of ESB outside of the safe area. I don't believe he's going to find the problem at the store. It's going to be outside that safe area. Because as far as I'm concerned, you could have his store right in the middle of the safe area. And his building's still going to be safe. It's the stuff after it gets out of the store. What do you have planned for that action? What, what do you mean? I mean? Somebody can go in the store and buy it that's an age. And walk it out, I mean. You can with alcohol, too. Yeah, you can do different liquor. 
It's what, a state. What's, what, what, do you, what do you have for a long range forecast or plan for this? Or do you? We I don't, don't because we're not required to have that. I mean, that's where the Sheriff's well, Department. I mean, for, I mean I'll, one more thing and then I'll drop it because I, my wife told me not to come down and make a fool of myself. <laughs> <laughs> is that it's great that you want to pass this and say yes is what he's, and he is going to do it. But it sounds like, and it, I have seen, as far as I'm concerned, I've already seen it. You guys approve things, the zoning board approves things, then after it's all been approved, you drop it. So I think... I don't think this is going to get dropped. I think the state is going to be I'm monitoring talking, these I'm pretty closely. Him selling the stuff is great. But what I'm saying is out, outside that red line, people can buy at his store and bring it back over the red line itself. Uh, the oh, red sure. line is the area around the school where there's no sales allowed. Right, but as far as I'm concerned, you could have the his store right across from the school and be safer than where it is right now. And don't look at that look. I know because <laughs> no. I lived in a town where the school, there was a store right across the road. And this gentleman didn't sell cigarettes, didn't sell booze to any of these. It was the store that was down the road two miles. Mm -hmm. He says, "Hey, they're watching him, and I got all the things to work with down here." So I'm right. just, I'm just putting it out well, the way I feel about it. It's, it's up to law enforcement. Well, you, to, you, as being a slugman, you are considered a law enforcement. Yeah, car, yeah, right. But it's no, not no, our. Not in this it, it, no, it's, not it's, in this it's, case. Not a, it's not our role to uh, enforce someone who is over 21 selling alcohol or cannabis products to someone a, who's well, under 21. What I'm really saying is it should be a concern of yours. Oh. It would be a violation of state law, which would be yeah. enforceable through a law enforcement, certified right. law enforcement officer. In this case, it would be Orange County. So it would be the Sheriff's Department for somebody who's doing open. Okay. So yeah. 18 VSA 4230A subsection 2A. Persons shall not consume cannabis in a public place. And then there's a so, fine structure. Yeah, so we would expect local law enforcement to enforce the laws around this just like we do alcohol and just like we do for okay. anything else that we do in town. You know, the, the state legislature um, passed the laws around retail cannabis and the governor signed it and our community voted in a well, public well, meeting to, is, to, to make it happen. And so this is the next... This, this is the, the next, next step. step. I think and, you're looking ahead to the next steps. <clears throat> and, mm -hmm. and yeah, well, we're going to be working with things as, as they occur, but this, this is really something that is, is part of a process, a much bigger process that's been you know, set, set in place um, by you know, the community and, and larger forces. Okay. And there'd be the opportunity, like we said earlier, it's the renewal period that you might even be looking at as well if there are issues that pop up. <clears throat> But well, we have the ability to pull our support too. Right. So if there's a problem three and months down the road, the select board can vote to pull that. And and that's why we approval. decided to have this board in place to begin with. We didn't. We weren't required to have this. Right. At all. Okay. Yeah. Well, the town actually voted, right? Well, the town well, voted the town to have the process, but we chose process. to have a local control board. We right. didn't have to have a local that's control true. board. That's true. Yes, that's true. So and it's we, all on the state if we didn't have this step. Right. Yeah. Which at least gives us a modicum of, at least it gives us some input mm -hmm. anyway. And it gives right. us yeah. at least some control. It gives us, yeah. it gives us what we can do, basically. Yeah. Okay. We have, can I just um, add one more thing real quick? No, hang on. We've got one on the screen. Okay. Sarah? Oh, did she? I thought she wanted to. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Yes, we got you, Sarah. Awesome. Um, sorry to, to interrupt. I uh, My name is Sarah Raid. I work as a senior planner with Two Rivers Adequichi Regional Commission. And fortuitously, I'm here for another reason, but fortuitous, fortuitously, I'm here also when you're having this discussion. I just wanted to share a little information that might be helpful as I'm responsible for, I'm our office's liaison to towns to support them in their deliberations around cannabis regulation. So my understanding of um, the sort of delegation of powers, as it were, is that the local cannabis control commission really only has authority to act on the basis of its zoning laws and any um, sort of sign and public nuisance ordinances that you have. And that's a very circumscribed um, 
envelope of authority that you have. So if, if there is a problem down the road and you wish to revoke a license, you can only do so if it is in direct contravention of your zoning bylaws or signage or public nuisance ordinances that you have on the books. Also, um, I would wanted to note, and this is a conversation we've been having with a bunch of other towns right now, um, the state is not responsible when they do their review of your of the application for any any cannabis establishment, not just retail. They are not checking compliance with local zoning bylaws because that is firmly within the purview of the town. So it is the town's responsibility to verify that all of those ordinances and requirements have been met locally. Um, technically. And what this is what I've been told is that applicants are supposed to have submitted a copy of their zoning permit with their application. So theoretically, the local Cannabis Control Commission is just sort of rubber stamping what the Planning Commission or your, your ZA or your ZBA has already done um, with the permitting process. But I wanted to flag that for you because I just want to make sure everybody understands that the state is not checking compliance with local bylaws and they are not responsible for enforcing compliance with local bylaws. So there's a very sort of strict wall, as it were, in terms of um, the, the powers that the LCC has and then that the state is, is retaining. Anyway, I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. One more comment. Um, you Yes, Sarah really took care of my what I was going to say pretty much. So thank you. I just want to add that um, you get another crack at this presumably at renewal time. It's like the, mm -hmm. I assume it's going to have the same rules as annually. alcohol. Yeah. So annually, we get a crack at you. If you decide that you blew it, and, <laughs> or you want to put in some more stringent rules, I think that was the whole point of the local control: is you have some ability to do that despite the limitations that Sarah just said. So it's not like it's done forever. It, there can be some more mm -hmm. moderate. So I said I'm not worried about the <laughs> store, I'm worried about the after effects. Yeah. All right, we have a motion and a second on the floor. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Can we lose Pat? We, we did it. Oh, no, he's there. I see. Thunder's last oh, second one down. Top French guest. I didn't get really? his vote. I haven't heard him at all. All right. We'll entertain a motion to adjourn this board. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We're going to call the Liquor Control Board to order. First up is public comment, and this is comment on anything for the Liquor Control Board that's not on the agenda. No Christmas samples? That's <laughs> <laughs> not. Dang. Seeing none, approval of the agenda? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Next up is to consider the liquor license for Bob's M&M &M beverage. The Any move questions? That we approve the uh, liquor license. This is a classic annual renewal, right? So yes, it is. I'm, uh, not knowing of any issues with Bob's, I would move that we approve the second class liquor license for Bob's M&M &M beverage. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Now we will call the regular select board to order. Oh, why must you are here? First up is public comment. This is anything that's not on the agenda. I believe you're first. Yes, I have over the last few months, I have been kind of pushed from one place to the other place. First I started out, I get, well, I left my name for the town manager to call me, he didn't call me. And I stopped in another. Can you say your name? My name's Kevin Nyshen. I live at 2502 Ridge Road. Thanks. And I was directed to Mr. Shane Groff, who is the town agent. And from him, I got what I thought I would get from him from an answer because I've known John for a while. So I'll get to what I'm after at in a minute. I went back, I called, I think it was you, the selectman about this, I think it was him, I'm not sure who it was, and he was going to follow up on my, my complaint. I never heard anything. I stopped back in here the other day because what was happening the other day was 
the straw that broke the camel's back. I stopped in. The secretary says he was busy working on his budget. I said, I don't care. I want to talk to him. Well, finally, yes, I got in there to talk to him. And he can sit there and shake his head. Well, what my thing is, is I want to know I why. You. I want to know why we are buying trucks without load covers on them. One, there's only 13 states in the United States that don't require load covers. It's a state law. The state of Vermont comes out of Tucker's Pit. Loads are always covered. Most of the other towns coming out of there, the loads are covered because of the law. Unless you get into what they call the six inch rule. And if you want to get into the six inch rule, you'll be spending another, on these drivers, you'll be spending another hour a day making sure their load is all within six inches of the size of the truck. And what Mr. Shangrau told me in the first place, ah, we're in the state of Vermont, we don't need it. I worked for a construction company for 30 years and loads were covered. It didn't matter if it was private or whatever. And I would like to know why we think the town of Randolph is so special that we don't need them. The reason I went to him last week was two of the six wheelers were hauling product out of Tucker's pit. I, I would say they were on the margin of almost doing over the speed limit. I don't know for sure, I don't have a speed gun. But they get to the end of the ridge road to take the left and all of a sudden there's material on the ground. I have spoken to Mr. Shangra once before about this. <clears throat> so, material on the road right there, stones in your windshield with no load cover, automatically says you're going to pay for the windshield, even if it wasn't your stone that broke it, came off your truck. I know this from being in this business. And I just think it should be brought to somebody's attention. These load trucks, when they're bought, be bought with load covers. For $2,300, you get getting a, this is one of the better ones. It's one that goes over and instead of barley comes back, locks the cover down. And why aren't we doing it? Why are we more special than anybody else? Like I said, even the state of Vermont does this. I want to know why, or at least you guys can talk about it and give me a question. My other question, why I'm, I'm bringing questions up, about I, I asked about that, it's just like the quarry up there. After the quarry got approved, everything kind of got dropped, and everybody's moaning and groaning now that Sprague has cut the whole tree line off along the ridge, along that road. Well, you know, if somebody on the road, I could care less because I agree, paid me well for 30 years. I'm not going to argue something that paid me well and supported me so I could retire at 65. But if they'd got out then instead of trying to fight to keep it closed, they could have kept the trees for the sound barrier in there because now the sound comes right over everybody's house. And if anybody knows when they're fighting this thing in the first place, instead of the people up on the upper part of the ridge road screaming, if the guy, people on the bound, down side of the road, ridge road would have said something because that sound goes right down the valley. So, sound won't travel up and go over. It just, wherever it's. And the other thing I see, I cannot see us buying tandem trucks and putting 10 or 12 foot straight blades on them. This town's got too many back, back roads that are rough, and you're going to break these plows. Even the ones you buy, the ones with all angle plows, you're going to break them. You need a dustpan that rolls over, and you need single axles of plowing way, because you need a mile and a half to turn the tandem around with a plow on it. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Any comments? I don't think we have anybody sitting here that can give you an answer right off the top. But I gave, more than I gave to the town manager that thing. I was in here a week ago. Yes, well, um, you're in front of the board now, not the town manager. Right. And so all I can tell you is I'm more than willing to have the conversation and look into it for you. I mean, I think it should be looked into because anybody can buy a truck, anybody buy a plow. But for $2,300, you can save you that in windshields. I know you got two of them, two of the trucks, one of the small trucks that the tires broke on us and never replaced it. And I don't care what a driver says, it takes too much time. They're all electric now. When I first was doing it, you got out there with the old 2 by 4 and rolled the 2 by 4 up and put it up on the headboard. And when you did it, done all, you have to go out and hold it down. And I can't get after these other trucks in good, 
You say, you guys gonna push the car? Yeah. Well, Randolph goes into it. <coughs> I mean, for four years, I have, up there on the Ridge Road, I have got out the trucks for using the Drake brakes too much. And the one thing I love about the most, some of the younger guys, well, we need the Drake brake. I say, guys, let's back down. I'm almost 70. I drove the trucks when they had twin sticks in them and no Drake brake. And especially the old Max, you wish you had an acre you could throw out. So most of these new trucks are just their brakes and won't stop. You don't need the Jake brakes. Most of them have been nice enough to shut the Jake brakes off. <clears throat> and these are things you guys probably don't hear. <laughs> no, but no. I'll look into it and get back to you. Okay. I will. All right, got to keep moving on this agenda, though. Um... Betsy, were you trying to come in on public comment? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, we just wanted to give you an update on the East Randolph community group and our yeah. work towards the renovation of the hall. We have a business plan just about ready to send to the board for next month's meeting. And it's also dovetailing with the ARPA application that Josie has um, been spending a lot of time at the ARPA meetings and has got pretty much ready to send in. The, and if we if the, we get the ARPA money, it will hopefully cover most of the cost for renovation to get into the hall to be producing some money to help take care of the um, maintenance and other things in the hall. So, so just, to, just to add to what Betsy's saying, um, what, we are, what we've worked on is a uh, mutually reinforcing, uh, you know, a business plan as per the select board request, which was a great idea. Um, and the uh, ARPA, application so that we are in the position of offering uh, income as well as hoping for outlays in the direction of the hall. So it's a, it's a two-way street and uh, stay tuned. I think you'll like it. All right, thanks. Any other public comment? Not seeing any, we'll move to approval of the agenda. So All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Motion carries. Um, next up is a public hearing on the proposed amendments to the traffic, parking, and speeding ordinance. So this is a chance for anybody that came to talk about the new ordinance changes. Uh, These will have to be specific to the changes that are in the ordinance. Okay. Just a comment from one of my neighbors the other night when I was talking to him. He was going to come, but he's busy, so he couldn't make it. He was going to suggest to the select board and people here in this ward, why don't we just stay down the speeding signs because they aren't helping at all because <laughs> the sheriff's department isn't doing their job because the ridge road is just like a right ridge track. Signage work, signage is out there, but if you got no enforcing, enforcement behind the signage, it's not going to be good. So it's, um, it's actually the Vermont State Police that are supposed to be patrolling the Ridge Road. Well, that's their the territory. Only thing you see on the Ridge Road is that when police, the state police go down, you see one car, and then about five minutes later, you see another one tagging behind them. Yep. All right. Well, I'm just, Any other? Uh, yeah, we're not going to take the signs down. But thank you for his I'm comment. Just what <laughs> <laughs> Any other public comments? Seeing none, we will close that part of the meeting and move on to the consent calendar, which is meeting minutes and warrants. Do I approve the consent calendar and warrants? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? Motion carries. Next up, consider RACDC Salisbury Square allocation request. This looks like it's an um, allocation that was approved before 
and they didn't do the work within the two-year window, so they're asking to not have to go back through and pay for and receive an allocation again. Is that pretty much the summary like of that? Is, right? That's how I've understood it, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have not been and did on the they pay the full one. fee? I don't believe so, no. So they... They paid at least some of it. I don't know if it was the full amount, so embedded in that. I don't know that we had anybody on who was scheduled for... It looks to me like it's... Yes, they just don't want to have to go back and pay what they've already paid. So it would not, seem to me it's fair yeah. to say, yes, you can yes. keep the credit can, for what you've already paid, but you still owe whatever the difference is to right. get your full allocation. Yeah. Right? Am I, I'm not missing nope. anything there, I am I? I think that's exactly where I would see this. So what I'll do maybe is take that back, gather Chris and Mark together. We'll figure out what that looks like. And in terms of if there are any dollars that are required. But can we approve that as a motion? That simple, they don't have to double pay? Sure. They, <laughs> yeah. they get credit, they get keep the allocation and get credit for what they've already paid, but they right. still have to yep. basically pay what it, wasn't extending paid. Extending a period of time. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'm fine with that. Is that a motion? Sure. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We're probably not going to hear any of Pat's votes. Make a lot of noise, Pat, if you don't like something. <laughs> Randolph Senior I'm Citizen sure. Center yes. tax exemption status oh, request for public meeting or for town meeting. Yep. And that's me, Emily, Daniel from the Okay, Randolph. hang on just a second. Oh, sorry. Let Trevor, oh, give sorry. us an sorry. introduction. Oh, I was going to, yeah, we we're going to let her, let her ride there. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of nice. Um, so, the senior citizen tax exemption that's voted on, this would be the expiration of the five-year period, so they'd be up for renewal. This is the mm -hmm. one where you get 10 years the first time out, and then it's five years each successive time. Two ways onto the town meeting warning, by petition or by action of the legislative body, because it's nice and early. We figured we'd have them before you to ask for you to put it on rather than to petition. That way, if for some reason you wanted them to petition, they'd have plenty of time to do that. So that's really the question is whether or not You'd want to place it on the town meeting warning. That's roughly what we did last year with the Randolph Center Fire Association. Mm -hmm. I think it's been done that way in the past for some others that, so wait, that predate me. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that would, and we just used, uh, you know, there's a version of the question mocked up in terms of how it would likely appear in your packets. It's pretty simple and straightforward, and that it says, you know, basically, will you authorize a five year extension? Here's the statutory reference. And, and then that exemption gets baked into our local agreement rate, so that that would remain unchanged as well, relatively speaking, at least. And then the voters just yeah yep vote on it, and that's it. That's fine to me. I don't have any problem with that approach. Yeah. Anything to add to that? Or are you all good with us just saying go no, for it? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> We're rocking over here. Okay. Um, do you need a motion for that? Probably. Uh, sure. Yeah. That way, I mean, you'll 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 authorize it now, and then you'll approve the warning, we'll approve the as, warning. A, as a whole thing exactly. later. Yeah. Anybody want to make a motion to just add it to the ballot? I'll I'll move that we add that appropriation to the ballot as indicated. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. An application for different grants for Kimball Library. This looked like it was two different grants. Two grants. Do you guys mind if we scooch out? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> it was great to meet you all. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you. We'll see you all tomorrow Bye -bye. at the market. Yeah. This was two different grants, no town funds in did, either one. Did they just need it? the town to apply for them. I think it's, yeah, it's just in, in accordance with our policy. It's the authorization. Authorization to apply in one case, I think it's retroactive because the deadline just passed. I think it was the energy related one. Amy's on and can maybe provide you a little more if you want. Do you want more detail on the grants? Are you good with them? If Amy's good with it, I'm good with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that a motion to authorize? Sure. Uh, there it is. Absolutely. So I'll this, second it. Okay, easy. that's easy. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> Next up is the Branchwood Parcel Site Assessment Update. So here is where Sarah actually was joining us for to provide an update on that. It was helpful that, that she was here earlier for sure. So 
This is really just to give, well, give you a sense of where we're at with the site assessment and planning process for the Branchwood parcel. Awesome. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yep. yep. Awesome. awesome. Um, thanks, um, so thanks, thanks so much for taking your time to, to, to chat this evening and to allow me to, to, to give you an update on where we're at. We're so at. for those so of you who aren't familiar, the, the, the Branchwood parcel, parcel is, of course, a town-owned town parcel. parcel. Um, um, it, it had, had the old Branchwood Mill on there, um, and that, that burned um, down about 20 years ago, and the parcel's been vacant ever since. The town had a really great sort of community visioning process around what folks were interested in possibly seeing that parcel redeveloped as, and there was a lot of interest in um, sort of a mixture sort of, of housing, housing and, and retail, space, retail and space and then also, also uh, like, uh, public like public park space, park space um, um, especially, especially serving younger younger, younger kids. kids. So, so um, the, the, the process, process of moving, of moving that, that parcel, parcel from, from a, a, a contaminated, contaminated parcel to a redeveloped a parcel, parcel is, is one that's overseen by the Vermont Department, Department of Environmental, Environmental Conservation through their Brownfields program. program. And the town has enrolled in the state's limited liability program, which effectively um, it is a commitment of the town to go through all the steps for assessment and remediation that DEC may require for that site to ensure that it's safe for public use and enjoyment um, into, into perpetuity in the future. And it's also a sort of leg up when it comes to accessing state funding, both for assessment and for cleanup, because they give preference to people who are in the limited liability program, and especially to municipalities. So the, the town is in a good position in that, in that enrollment. Um, where we're at Where with we're assessment at on the site, on the site. Two Rivers has been very fortunate to have grant funding from um, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency as well as from the state to assist um, towns and private landowners and prospective purchasers with assessing brownfield sites around our region. And the Branchwood site has been a big focus for our program for the past um, couple of years. And so we've put quite a bit of money into the site at this point. We did a phase one assessment back in 2020. Um, and then that basically the phase one a desk review desk with a, a brief site visit, um, visual inspection that made recommendations for the kinds of contaminants that could be present on site that should be investigated for. And then we paid for a phase two to be done at the site, which is really where you start actually putting holes in the ground and testing um, and determining what contaminants are present um, on the site. And that uh, study, uh, was study was finished, finished in uh, late, uh, late 2021, 2021 um, just about a year ago. And that site, that, based, that, that assessment, assessment basically found that, that there were that two, there were two um, classes um, of classes contaminants, contaminants present, present in the soil, the soil on the site. On the site. Um, and those um, were and dioxin and purans, purans, and then also, and then also polycyclic, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs. And those are contaminants that are basically found in almost every developed community in the country. Right, they're they're pretty, they're ubiquitous. pretty ubiquitous. They just sort of go hand in glove with normal development, um, but they were but they at were concentrations at that were higher than the standards that DEC considers to be safe. So, um, also that study looked at groundwater and found no contamination in the groundwater whatsoever, which is very encouraging. So, all told, um, you know, the findings of that phase two investigation were very encouraging because we we could have seen far worse contamination on that site given its long history um, of economic use in the town. So, really, it's it's not bad um, for for all the years that it's of service that it's given, um, and. Fortunately, Fortunately, the, the two the classes two of contaminants, contaminants that, I, that I mentioned, I mentioned are pretty are inert, pretty inert. Um, so, um, they, so they don't they really don't wash, wash out in the rain. rain. Um, um, there's, there's, we don't expect there's any problems there's from stormwater storm runoff coming from the site. We also don't expect um, them to have any impacts on the air, so they're not going to volatilize and people, it's, it's not going to be a problem for people breathing them. Um, the real concern um, the real comes concern when you actually start putting shovels in the ground and moving the earth and people come in contact with it. And of course, you know, if the town were to build houses, build there, or houses or there or to um, build a park, build a park there, there, as was there, discussed during the community the visioning process, process. And then you, you certainly don't want certainly kids crawling around in that dirt. Um, so, so typically, typically when we see when this we kind see of contamination, contamination on site, on site um, um, DEC will, will DEC look will at the phase two report and they'll say, okay, do we feel confident we have enough information? DEC looked at the phase two report and they said, well, we did a whole bunch of soil sampling across the entire site. And it's quite a large site. It's about two acres. Um, um, 
We did all this soil sampling, but we only went down to one and a half feet. Um, that was the, the depth of the soil sampling that we did. And so we would like to confirm that there's no contamination below that level. So what they've requested is limited sampling. We're talking about maybe 10 um, deeper soil samples across the entirety of the site that's going to go um, as far down as five feet below ground surface. So they're going to they're going to do sort of two levels of testing. They're going to go down to about three feet below ground surface, and then they're going to go down to five feet below ground surface if they find contamination at the three foot level. So, so um, that's, um, sort, that's of sort of the request that DC has put out there. out there. The consultant, the consultant that Two Rivers that has been paying to do all of this all assessment this work, work, the HB, has, has come up with a, a um, sampling, sampling plan, plan to, to acquiesce to, to, to DEC's requests. requests. Um, um, and that sampling plan is currently on uh, DEC's uh, desk, waiting for review. It's been on their desk for quite some time now. Um, I was able to have a conversation with our DEC site manager um, last week, I think. The days are running together not too long ago. Um, and she, she recognized that it needed to be reviewed, and she said she would try to push it up her priority list. They're unfortunately, their office is way understaffed right now, and they're all underwater. So they'll do the best they can to get us um, some feedback on that plan and hopefully keep things moving. In the meantime, Two Rivers has run out of um, grant funding to help anybody in the region um, with assessment of these kinds of sites, which is um, very, very depressing for us because we like to be able to f assist folks. Um, we have applied for more funding, but that funding is not going to really kick into gear until um, later in 2023 at, at the best um, shots. So what we are looking at is a cost of approximately 36 grand um, is the, the latest estimate that I've seen from BHB for conducting this supplemental site investigation that DEC is requiring. Um, DEC can provide funding assistance to help the town um, if you're interested in seeking that funding assistance from them. And so basically that process would be, and I've already had a preliminary conversation with the site manager about this when I was talking with her um, just, just a week or so ago and said, you know, Two Rivers is out of funding. Is there any possibility that DEC could kick in some funding here, and she said that that is a possibility. There's a process for doing that, um, and that's to fill out an application that then gets set, sent to DEC for their own um, internal budgeting process. Two Rivers is more than happy to assist with that application if and when the time comes that the town would like that assistance. Um, there's also potentially uh, a new um, grant, um, program grant program that's program opening up that's opening to help up folks with, with assessment, assessment of brownfield sites. Brownfield as far as, as I've heard, heard, the latest I've heard, that that application is not available yet, but the money will be coming through um, the Department of Economic Development through the ACCD, Agency of Commerce and Community Development. But again, we're still waiting for that application to drop. So there should be two sources of funding, potential funding at least, um, that the town could chase after in order to fund this particular supplemental site investigation. Um, so I hope that gives you sort of a good overview of where we're at right now. I'm happy to take any questions, and I'm always available um, if anybody wants to give me a call at the office and we can talk further. So, Sarah, the progress that's made till now, does any of that have a shelf life on it, or can we just wait until late 23 to till you guys get the additional funding to go to the next step? So that really is going to be determined by DC. Um, they they sort of drive the timeline for um, when assessment needs to be completed. That said, obviously they haven't gotten back to us for a good three months or so, on or maybe even longer at this point um, on the the site plan. So this is clearly not a, a big concern from them in terms of like keeping things moving quickly. Um, even though I know I totally recognize that they, they're their workload is preventing them from getting it done. But I don't think, I think if this was a, a site of major concern for them, they would have bumped it up the priority list earlier. So I don't know if we're going to get like a request from DEC to actually say, you've got to get keep, get this moving faster. Um, it's very possible that maybe we could just wait until funding becomes available. However, um, I think it's a conversation that we need to keep fresh and keep talking to DEC about just so that everybody's on the same page. Um, so once we hear back from DEC on the site plan, that's when the funding conversation will start. Um, and again, Two Rivers is happy to be part of that if you would like us to. Um, and, and that's sort of when 
DEC can make some decisions about, okay, well, when is their funding available and how soon do they really need the town to act on um, the next steps for this regulatory process, that sort of thing. So I'm sorry, I don't have a clear answer right now, but it's all, it's all really driven by DEC. When we started this and were asked if we would participate in this, there was gonna be no cost to the town. So it feels like we're now at a point and you're saying DEC could force the town into doing something which would cost us 36000 So when we started the process, it was, I hope I communicated clearly that, you know, we can assist as far as our grant funds allow, right? So we, we have grant funding. It's not a limitless pool of funding. Um, the DEC has a lot of funding too. And so does ACCD. So the chances are very, very good that the town can get funding from those other sources. Plus you're in the Brella program, which gives you priority consideration um, amongst the applicant pool. So it is, there's, there's a possibility that maybe funding doesn't become available, but I think the, the chances are very good. Um, and because, especially because you're a municipal applicant, they do give preference to those as well. Um, so that's, that's the best answer I can give right now. It's really something that we've just got to continue talking with DEC about and potentially ACCD as well. And Two Rivers is happy to assist with that process. Well, I think if they're happy to assist with the process, then we'll just go see if we can get the money. Yeah. Because otherwise we're going to do nothing with this property and it's just going to sit there longer and longer and longer and generate nothing. So the sooner we figure out how we're going to get something done on that property, the better off we're going to be. So I would say, you know, if they're willing to help us try to find some funding here, mm -hmm. that we go down that path and see what's available. Yeah. No, I think it's it's interesting that DEC wanted the additional holes drilled, and literally the map is a site map with some dots on it. Yeah. And it's three was there a specific area like that. that you found where there was more concentration, or was it just broadly off on that site? It's pretty evenly um, distributed. The PAHs are concentrated on the north side of Pearl Street, um, so just the northern portion of the site, and there's no exceedance of state standards for PAHs on the southern portion of the site. For dioxins and furans, the exceedances are pretty um, uniformly bad all the way across the entirety of the site. Okay. I asked a question. I don't think we have much choice. Yep, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> now, on these uh, test mooring you're doing, you say they only went down a foot? Foot and a half. Why didn't they go down deeper in the first place? Because you don't, in the first phase, you don't. Because a, a foot borehole isn't going to give you much of anything. Basically, all you get at a foot is what's on top. You could go down five feet and hit, hit everything fresh. Mm. So I, mean, I, I have seen this in, in the construction business before. I mean, we're, we're going back and we're, the town, you're asking for the town to pay more money to do a job a second time. So the initial procedure, oh, sorry. I said I'm just looking for an answer. So the initial procedure that was taken for the phase two was to drill, I don't even remember how many holes, but they were tons and tons of holes to get a sense of the horizontal distribution of contamination. Um, that was an extremely costly study to do all of that testing, but it was a, it was an attempt to see, okay, horizontally, where is there, where are there hot spots for contamination? Um, with the idea that if you found a section of the property that had no hot spots for contamination, that nothing was showing up, then it wouldn't make sense to drill deeper in those particular areas. The results of this study were that, unfortunately, the contamination is, is distributed pretty evenly, right? So thankfully, what we're seeing though for this site plan is that we don't have to drill another 100 deep holes, right? We're only gonna have to drill about 10 holes. So we're, they're very targeted, um, sort of, they're considered representative samples. So we'll dig, we'll dig in certain areas of the site. And if something comes back with, you know, significant contamination, DEC may require additional investigation in that area. This is sort of the normal course of Brownfield's assessments, right, where we don't, um, we can't test everything because that would cost literally hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, and it's not necessarily the most efficient approach. So you try to take an approach that is both cost of a 
cost effective and will give you some information that will at least lead you to the next step. Um, and that was the purpose of the phase two. Um, many sites go through a phase two plus a supplemental site investigation if DEC requests it. And sometimes they have additional investigation beyond that if something weird comes up in the supplemental site investigation. Again, that's just the process that the town committed to when they signed up for the Brella program was to, to say, okay, we'll work with you DEC to figure out the full extent of the contamination on the site. Thank you. Okay. This isn't on the agenda for any action, but it sounds like we want to keep two rivers engaged and I think you should and pushing for the plan to be approved by <coughs> DEC, but also in helping find funding to pay for the well, yeah, I mean, supplemental funds are out there and those resources, I think you would move it along and just see what comes up. You know, if they came back and said, Oh well let's we can do, you know, ninety percent of it and well then we can talk about that when you get to that point, but I think they're hundred percent funding that oh, DEC has it. No, no, buy it. That's <laughs> there's hundred percent funding anything at this point. That's so, Sarah, I think the direction is to keep hounding DEC to approve the plan, and then um, work with the town to see if we can locate funding through DEC, probably, to pay for it. Happy to help. Who should I be working with? I know that Josh has obviously left the town. Who's the best point person for me to work with on this site moving forward? We're, we're going to connect you with Mark Rosalbo, who stepped into the role Josh had. Um, will probably be the, the best one to coordinate. Kim, who's sitting next to me, will, will make that connection. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. Further questions? Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you all. Next up is to consider the appraiser's errors and emissions and homestead changes. This is basically the annual reconciliation. Yes. Um, it's in accordance with Title 32, Section 4261, the listers with the approval of the select board. Because it's not just the appraiser, it's like the board of listers. Um, we'd like to correct the following errors. And emissions from the grand list, and these are just, I have assigned one from the listers for you guys to sign. Just showing like the homestead changes that have occurred since the, as the grand list has been launched. Um, and these are people filing changes of business use of their outbuildings or their business rental use after the as bill grand list. And um, this is a appraiser, but I am an assessor, I don't want anyone to think that I have appraiser credentials. <laughs> <laughs> Just leave that Anybody have any questions on it. the list? Right. <laughs> um, I'm referring to your skill set colloquially. Colloquially, yes. <laughs> um, Did anybody have any questions on the ones that are there? No. Nope. Pretty much the standard. Anybody mm -hmm. want to make a motion to approve it? Oh, sure. Go Do we right have to sign the version I'll you make have? a motion to approve that. Or the yeah, version he has. If this you've got one, signatures on yours, we'll roll with that one. Okay, yeah, and this one we'll get like three hole punch and put behind the as build grand list in the town clerk's um, office. Was that a motion? I did. To approve it? Yep. Was there a second? A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Motion carries. Okay. Pass that around and send it right back to you. Got a pen 24 here? budget no, goals and priorities. I don't use those, right? Don't you use your finger? I just don't sign anything anymore. It's just oh. everything's digital. That's yeah, true. <laughs> this little digital initial thing. Script font. So this so, so I know it doesn't really matter, but since we don't really need to have a motion and a vote and sign, like does it kind of like one or the other usually? No, you have a motion and a vote to accept it, and the signature is a requirement of law. Okay. Same as when we sell plots, when we do liquor licenses, we sell, sign all those after we take motions. One's for the record, one's for the court someday if somebody can feel it. Okay, no, thank you. Okay. Just correcting my uh, spelling of my name here. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's quite all right. <laughs> it happens all the time. Uh, I, would, right, I would be a wealthy, wealthy man if I had even a nickel for every time I've gotten ER instead of RE. <laughs> that's right. 
I mean, Imagine the way mine is spelled. In my, name too. <laughs> <laughs> my father changed the name legally because he thought it was easier to spell. <laughs> Worst thing he ever did. <laughs> I'm <pretty cool>. <laughs> <laughs> See you, Mimi. All right. Bye, Mimi. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Budget goals. Yeah, so this was put on. There was some conversation about whether or not we should set some budget goals and priorities based on various questions, um, community feedback. So it's really, do you as a board want to set some sort of level of parameter on the budget development process? We're a little bit later than we would normally be in producing a full draft. That ties into all kinds of staffing fluctuations and whatnot, but we're making progress toward that. Um, we're having a complete version. I've got something I can share with you on paper and I'll put it up on the screen. This is a summary look at where we're at with um, what you could consider the fixed costs in. So these are our personnel costs, so health insurance, projected wage increases, um, the library's numbers which came in the other day are included in this summary. It's got our insurances for property and casualty, workers' comp, all of those things are in there. Our debt service payments are updated. So all of the things that we essentially committed, at least at some level, into paying. It does have a few new things in there. Um, should I do a formal share screen, right? Yeah. It's too loud. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's very open, Remember, those are extremely rough there. So a little smaller just so we can okay. So these are just some summary numbers. Like I said, we haven't begun to program in some of the other operating numbers. So there are some large cost centers or some volatile ones that aren't in here. When you look at the highway fund. We aren't currently projecting anything as a change for fuel costs, for example, but we know that that's you know pinning down what that number should be and trying to project what it'll be in 18 months um, is an exercise we have to do. So this is just to give you a snapshot of where we'd be starting from should you decide to set goals that are at some point um, different than these percentage or number increases here. Um, so some of this is... Um, Obviously, it's an easier exercise if you want to add money. And close to 20 years of local government, you'd be the first ones to ask me to really do that. Um, so we're anticipating you're going to want to hold and or um, take some direction in the other action. So you can see general fund, when you add everything up, that's about 7.2% to start. Highway fund, we're at about a little less than 4%. The library's funds came in at 8.31%. Um, it's a little different than the numbers you guys submitted, Amy, just because I added your property and casualty and um, workers' comp numbers came in from VLCT the other day, and I'll send those back to you. We added those just before showtime. I'm predicting no change in the police district contract. This assumes that that contract stays in existence at the rates already agreed to for <coughs> the hours already agreed to. So there's potentially some variability there. And the water fund and wastewater fund really have any debt service issuances <coughs> and personnel costs embedded in those. So we still also have here chemicals in particular have been one of the cost centers there that's had a little volatility through the inflation period. So those would be some pressures that aren't showing there. So just to give you an idea of where we'd be starting from in an order of magnitude, if you wanted to do something at various percentage rates and or if you wanted to go into, say, a level fund scenario, sometimes what boards consider are level tax rate scenarios that involves some additional mathematics. We want to make sure that we're pretty well confident in our non-tax revenues, what our grand list is going to do, um, and then from there we can start to work it backwards. It's still roughly, um, you can see in the general fund, between here and last, or the current fiscal year, you're about $250,000 different. What to note about that, though, is you'll notice there's that huge increase in the ambulance one. They came forward with a 10 or 11% increase, mm -hmm. and that was on top of years of under budgeting that figure. The budget was looking backwards when it should have looked part current, part forward. So we're assuming that's what's going to happen moving forward. Um, 
So that's about $53,000 out of that. What's embedded in the general fund too is going back to an earlier conversation about zoning administrator capacity and the addition of a full-time person there. That explains There's about $105,000 of cost when you add up everything from salary to benefits. We have to assume this person's on a family health insurance plan. That's $29,000 and change. So that's about 105 of that. So of that 250, you got about 150 a little more of it that's tied up in those two things. Mm -hmm. Some of the other increases is we had luck in prior years um, in people who came on or were already on. Their health insurance went from family plans to buyouts or two-person plans to buyouts or they generally trended in the more cost-effective direction in terms of overall dollars. We've gone the other way with some of this cycle. So there's quite a few different changes. In addition to that new zoning administrator, and then you look a little bit throughout, people have changed plans or we've hired people who are on family plans, replacing people who are on a two-person or a single. That's anywhere from a $15,000, you know, $8,000 to $15,000 swing, depending on that. Retirement costs are up again. We knew those were coming, but that's another couple of percent that goes on with any salary changes. So that number's going to be a little bit bigger by a factor anyway. So those are the main things in, the, in both the general and the highway fund. There are, like I said, there's still some things that are unknown. If you just took this right here and the grand list remains unchanged and our non-tax revenue does what we think it's going to do based on really no increases in most of it, except for the current use and pilot payments based on sort of the assessor's estimates or some state figures we got within the last month or so. You're talking about five, about five and a half cents would be the increase on the, on on the, the tax property tax rate. That was going to be my next question. Yeah. And so that's two hundred dollars to $300,000 a year. You're talking one hundred and ten dollars to $165 for the year would be the increase on that home range. So anywhere from 9 to $14 a month. Last year we were in the 6 to $10 per month sort of range. Um, so just to kind of give you a sense of where you're at least starting from and what that encapsulates, it's all of that. If you want to take 250 out, you grab the 150 that seems easy somehow. Um, I mean, the ambulance you're probably just moving out as a separate question, so it's not in the general fund. You're giving the voters direct access to it. Otherwise, we'd have to make up that money somewhere else um, in there. You're really getting into... There's a little bit of level of service. There's some things we can do on the operating side that might reduce costs. We've got an increase in technology baked in there. We've been burning through that line for years, so it was really more of a true-up than an increase. Um, but we could look into that, what's gone into that. Some of that has been the consultant pay, so as we've been finance director free, some of that's been booked in there because NEMRIC has filled in and that's where we've generally paid for them. Probably not the best spot for it, um, but that's why you'll see spikes. In, in addition to the server needed to be upgraded a little earlier than expected, that was in the last fiscal year. So we've had a few things like that. So there, we can probably twist those down a little bit, but even still, you take miscellaneous changes, you're not getting it all. Um, so it might be what should service levels look like, and if it's not, I mean, it's really it's either people or capital funding. Those are the, the two big cost centers that, that are left. Mm -hmm. And if you do capital transfers, we'll have to reorient that plan to the available resources. And it might mean some things happen later than expected. Some pieces of equipment stay later than, than what a replacement schedule would be. It's, those are the, t the types of trades you might make. We can also get creative and try to use, we were talking a little bit earlier, you know, for paving for next year. It's been a while since we've had a class two paving grant. You now we look to build a program for next year, kind of around that as a centerpiece if we're able to get it. That's a, what, they're $175,000 max, I think, right now, so you can stretch that out. Um, if, we, if we've got an eligible project, of course, I mean, that's, that's part of the trick. But So we can look to try to do those things too, to, take existing resources and keep them moving. But if you cut those transfers down this year, then that's the ladder back to it at some other point. So um, we can make a math equation to come up with whatever it is the goals are. It's just sort of what are the operational pressure points along the way. So the concerns that I've heard are affordability is what the big one is and the, the constant increase 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 and the problem is the town budget's only a fraction of the property tax bill right? the school budget which we have no control over is what has been driving the big increases 
but you know there's a lot of people that are on the edge of being able to keep their homestead together with income and you know they're facing huge increases with fuel and and whatnot right now it's just I just thought it was worth the having the conversation of do we try to at least control what that increase is and and what we're doing and and actually take a hard look at what our programs are doing and do we need to do all of it is it you know where should we be looking at this you know an increase every year adds up yeah <laughs> but at the same token all the things that we're doing are getting increased you know yeah fuel labor it's kind of hard to swallow all that <clears throat> And it's mm -hmm. happening in the homes, in the yeah, it's homes across too. the board. It's, you know, it's just, I mean, a cert, it's, certain, there's a certain amount of sort of background inflation, which always happens, which you know, it's just part of the normal world. So we expect things to go up at least, you know, somewhat from year to year. I mean, that's 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 just that's just normal. And then, so I think what we're talking about here really is more, you know, how much do we want to buffer? our local residents from the extra sort of extraordinary increase in inflation which we've experienced as, as a nation, right, in the last year or two. And so I think you can just kind of think of it through that lens of we always know we're going to go up by a few percentage points just to kind of keep everything going. That's just year in and year out. We have this special sort of time right now. And so the question is, you know, I think, you know, have the folks in the community who are going to ask to pay for this, have their wages been increasing along with inflation? Some people's have. Some people are doing well. Some people have had wage increases along with the inflation, uh, but some people haven't. And so figuring out, you know, where... Well, then there's people that are on fixed incomes that aren't even drawing a wage. You know, they're... Right. The, but, those are the but, ones that are affected the right. most but like social security has got the biggest yeah they the just got increase in a long yeah. in a long time so yeah. but when your wage is set on what you earned 40 years ago <laughs> you know even 20 yeah. percent on top of a 800 dollars a month social security check isn't much right but if we're talking it's, about increasing taxes by eight percent and someone got a 20 percent increase in social security then it's better they're better off than they were before <clears throat> Well, yeah, Actually, but it's, it's not. Unfortunately, it's going to no, because you're buying. Well, you, you, your buying power is lower today. Eight hundred dollars three years ago bought you a heck of a lot more than eight hundred dollars today buys well, you. Well, of, of course, I'm not talking about over time. I'm talking about just from one year to the next. Right, that's, but, what, that's what we're talking about here. But in the last year, the cost of fuel has skyrocketed. Food has skyrocketed. Medications have skyrocketed. Electric bills are jumping. What they got a huge rate key increase. All those pieces pile up on these folks with a limited income, and we sit here and say, "Well, our increase is only two percent. They can handle two percent. Well, it's two percent from us. What is it going to be? Six percent from the school, and you know, a twenty percent increase in fuel and and an increase in food, and you know, it's the the problem is the piling on of all this." You know, we've got some people in this town who have owned their houses for 50, 60 years that aren't able to quite make the ends meet. Right. And they're going to have to sell that homestead because all of these costs are piling on. It's not just the town, it's everything. And it's like, at what point do we start saying, what is the role of the town? What, what should we be providing? And, you know, do we have to have all these increases? And it's not just us. I mean, our piece is small in the tax bill compared to the school. The school bill is going to, mm -hmm. is the one where we could really make a dent in affordability, I think. Right, but, right. No, I, I agree. And, 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 and then when we talk about the tax bill for the, for the town, you know, half, half our budget is, is the highways, which mm -hmm. my understanding is we've been underfunding already for a long time so and we see it in our infrastructure you know and so what's, what's you know there's the cost of doing stuff but then there's also the cost of not, not doing, doing stuff yeah. and we often find that in the long run the cost of not doing stuff ends up being more costly more costly so you know how much has the grand list grown trevor in the last five years five years that's that, a huge problem in my mind we're not yeah. we're not growing the grand list values here to help with this problem. So as long as our grand list continues to 
grow by one or two percent, you know, at the most. I don't even know if it's that much. No, I don't know about five years, but when you go back to when we set the rates the last couple of years, we were talking, I think, a percent or less in yeah. each case. That, and and the, therein lies part of the problem is because yeah. we're not we're not growing the community to bring in new business or new buildings or new whatever to to use some of these services more efficiently and picking up their tax, you know, picking up taxes on that. We have that same conversation every year. Well, yeah, I've been having it for seven years. I got I know, a graph. I, I got a graph just, that looks I'm, like this. And guess what? You. We're we're now approaching this point here where this is now becoming a bigger issue because we're not growing that grand list at the same pace that the increases of expenses to the town are growing. Mm -hmm. And we're in more of a pickle right now because of the inflationary costs mm -hmm. between what, labor and fuel and those light. things. And it's bringing it to light everywhere. You know, we this whole came up because at the state level we're having the same conversation. You know, salt prices increased 30% and fuel prices jumped 20%. You know, you start taking those numbers on a bigger scale, it gets even worse. The alligator mouth goes, goes much bigger. Yeah. Like the towns is going like this, the states is going like yeah. this. It's and just, it's brutal. We're, we're setting aside projects. The money's just not there and you just can't go out and, and print more. And have an anti-business environment. This you is know, a result. You're going to get to the point where people can't pay the taxes and then you're going to have are receivable. Mm -hmm. You won't have the cash to do it either. So, and quite a pickle. And they're in quite a pickle. Employment situation is bad. Not growing businesses is bad, and it's all starting to rear its little ugly head here. So, up there at the legislature, <laughs> when you get there, uh -huh. I think about that a little doing? bit <laughs> because workforce is an issue, and workforce is a problem because businesses can't hire people, so therefore they're not going to they're not coming. They're not expanding. And they're not expanding. Business services aren't expanding. It's a problem. So, I guess. That doesn't answer the question. No, nope, I guess in my mind, it's like, okay, well, figure out where you can level out without having too much of an effect and figure out how much we got to increase it. Because <coughs> it's inevitable that you're going to have to do something. Mm -hmm. It's not sustainable. So, <laughs> that's me putting it back on you a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things we can create, too, is a. Uh, it's almost a scenario table, if you think of it that way. And so we can identify, it'll take a little bit to put together, but we can identify basically what are some of the options for taking the number, you know, presumably down, we're not going to build it. So, I mean, you could, it would work either way, but um, so maybe there's a menu you could sort of choose from to see what combination. We could show you different combinations based on percentage targets. So just to say, if you wanted to be at 3% from last year, Here's how you get there from here, and or here's what's sort of left undone, left or hand, and or yeah. here are the things that we need some sort of policy or operational decision on. There's that. If you level, um, we could do that. So then you can kind of see, plus as we start to program in some of those fuel costs, those types of things, you'll have a fuller picture of exactly just, you know, just how much wiggle room you've got. Um, in there and or what some of those additional pressures really are. Um, it's coming at a bad time to have all these costs spike because we're also at a time when there's an unprecedented amount of federal money out there mm -hmm. and we need to spend some local money to have the engineering to a point where we can go get it and going to get it then cuts down our maintenance costs right because we redid the road or we redid the, the water sewer lines and it's just a vicious place to be. But it's the, this question is the one that unlocks the rest. Well, this, this is the, the point in the maze where we've got three or four pathways, mm -hmm. whichever one you pick. Because when we think about how to build the capital plan, you know, next year and the four years after flow mm -hmm. out of, of whatever the decision is. So it, it's just some of this is also kind of come down to like the whole conversation about the town projects to go into the ARPA funding. Mm -hmm. Like, does that move some of the highway projects or some of the the water wastewater projects that are we're seeing as creating part of this increase into that funding, so it doesn't become tax funding? You know, it's it's balancing some of that in mm -hmm. with it, I think. But I'm not sure if the timeline for moving that and how that's going to marry up with this. It seems to be very lagging. Yeah, for, It would be nice if that list of projects in priority order was here as we were doing the budget. 
if you did your budget in May, there's only one other town that does that. But if you did it in May, for example, there'd be that really nice ability to marry those two up. But because we're in March, we're just going to be. Well, you know, the select board has the ability to make the decisions on using that funding. We mm -hmm. could say, look, we're taking X number of dollars of that now. So the applications for priority years only have this dollar amount now because we're going to mm -hmm. balance some of this. Some of the things that are in here are, or that aren't in here, we talked about an engineering services agreement being baked in there. That's not in this model yet. Because um, if we had to figure out how to make numbers come down, that's, you know, five, seventy, five hundred, ten thousand, whatever we ended up this sort of a service level. Um, it does have a mowing, two-year mowing contract for the East Randolph and Randolph Center cemeteries. That's a thirty, thirty-five thousand dollar proposition based on what it cost last year. Um, That's a, a item that we ought to for which there be is going a, into because there's revenue. Yeah, we get a couple hundred bucks, three hundred bucks for a cemetery plot, and then yeah. we're responsible to maintain it for the it's in perpetuity. Mm. Like that rate to me seems pretty low. Actually, looking back, I think it was only. It was eighty-five dollars in the '60s for one. So we haven't gone up much from the '60s, but only because I found our family's deed the other day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but, it would be, it would be nice know, if, the, if, the, if the cemeteries broke even or came close. I don't think you're going to see that because if we're spending thirty-five thousand a year in mowing on them yeah well it's and you sell it's it's a problem at what point yeah you know well I think, it's a good, I think it's a good conversation to have I've, I've I asked the um, even before Trevor was here I asked Adolfo for sort of a breakdown of like what does it actually cost us and annually to run to run the cemeteries and um, and what's our how mm -hmm. much money do we revenue well, do we have and and I, we, st we still don't actually know, I don't, I don't think. There's right? two, we still don't have good figures on. But there's two parts of it, right? There's the, what's the revenue coming in and what we're charging, and what's the service level? You know, we're, is our service level there, the amount of times we're mowing and weed whacking and whatnot, at a higher service level than what we need there? You know, like, I don't know how they, they go what. But Every my, week. My, my understanding is that we don't actually have figures that the way buildings and grounds doesn't break out cemeteries from the rest of what they do. We do now because we do it on a contract. Yeah. This would be a little bit easier with the contract and the fact that we're, we didn't do burials last summer. So if you looked just at last year, you could probably come up with a, something closer to a cost. But for the other cemeteries, that's just baked into the labor cost and the general equipment. So we'd have to spend a summer, I think, trying to track it so then we can then record it in either the, the budget or somewhere else that we could say, you know, there were X number of hours spent. Here, here's what we did while we were there. I mean, most of it's mowing and trimming. Mm -hmm. But it might be worth sitting down with that cemetery mm -hmm. commission and having that conversation of, mm -hmm. you know, what is the real, what's the balance here? Make but that's not going to be a lot of resident on the cemetery maintenance. Sure. Um, my name is Matt Morowski. Um, having driven by the Pleasant Street Cemetery for 15 years and, and, and talked to plenty of people in town, it's sort of a going joke that it is the most mowed piece of property in the village, and it looks worse than every other property in the village. And so I think um, it's probably we're not getting our money's worth for uh, <laughs> the contract. It gets mowed and then the grass gets burnt and then there's nothing to mow, but they mow it anyway. It gets mowed and mowed the same tracks until it's scalped down to nothing. It's, it's not a funny thing. Oh, golly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and then the one in the street adopts, the, the, the grass gets to be this tall, right? Well, so no, because the, the neighbor mows it now. Oh, is sure. that right? The guy next door is the one that got the contract oh. in the A frames there. Okay. But, you know, does it have to be mowed every week? Could we go three times a month? In the first part of the summer and then twice a month later in the summer when the grass slows down you know i think that's some of the other way to control those costs right it's kind of have so, that level so of service for, discussion for that you'll have to lean on the you know the leads in those departments in order to make those decisions and just yeah yeah well, i just 
calculating out some numbers here, the majority of this, you know, this increase boils down to, if I'm not mistaken, you know, it's a lot of, you know, staff type mm -hmm. cost. And yeah. I don't know how you get around that because you're not going to hire people for less than what you paid them <laughs> five years ago. And in order to be competitive and have people here, we've all seen what we've got to do. So it doesn't matter whether you're in business or whether you're, you know, running the town. You've still got to have people and you've got to be able to be competitive. So... Yes, and, and, and as we've seen, the cost of not having people in these roles yeah, exactly. is Exactly, and we have, yes, exactly. <coughs> we, we've, we've, that is another thing we've all experienced. So, yeah, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough place to be. And so, you know, <coughs> there's, like I said, boils down to less economic growth, not keeping pace. Anyways, does that give you what you need? <laughs> Do you, want, do you want me to try to mock up a couple of different scenarios? And those will serve almost as a set of choice tables for you. Um, and we do like a level of 3% and a 5%, just so you can see the iterations too. I don't know if that makes sense. That's I broke it down in one other community that way, and it seemed to be helpful. In I don't think we want to go with more than a 5%. I mean, some of these are 8 mm -hmm. More, I mean, yeah. you've got an 8% increase in the library. So you just like, do that's give and a take tough one. And see what happens. Yeah. yeah, we might be able to find, you know, some might be slightly higher, might be able to cut some others, right? And you know, your point about the highway is right like your bigger increases, your fuel, your road salt, your whatnot that's where it's hitting. So that one, we've got the employee costs and the material costs. It's a brutal year. It's just a brutal year. Okay. And again, I just think we really need to just be careful when we, you know, when we decide to, you know, make try to make do with less that it's going to have cumulative effects in, in you know in the years going forward, and that we'll have to, we will likely have to make that up somehow, um, probably in a more expensive way. Um, in the future, and that if we're looking at trying to grow the local economy where, you know, the local economy depends upon a lot of this stuff, and, you know, for years we didn't have an economic development coordinator <clears throat> because we didn't want to spend the money, and we've seen now what bringing that person on has, you know, that role more than pays for itself. Oh, absolutely. And so I just want to make sure that if we're, when we're talking about not funding things that we're not setting ourselves up in the long run to actually make that, that divergence of those curves even worse um, than, than better, because we're really focused on this, you know, on this one particular year. I do worry about yeah. the staffing component just because it's, we've been a year in this and we're just about <laughs> there. It feels very much like we're, you know, sis collectively Sisyphus, we've made it the rock is just about at the top. <laughs> I'm just afraid it'll let go and we'll start again and mm. the impacts of that. But, um, but maybe in doing the exercise, we're able to find insulation or find opportunity. But I, I think they'll be, the lower you go number-wise, the harder the choices to get, which you guys already know. But. And, and you know, I do feel like we've done a really good job of paying attention to the budget and, you know, and really spending on money on essential stuff. You know, it's not like we're... You know, spending gobs of money on all sorts of things we don't need. It's been a pretty careful, pretty trim budget, at least as long as I've been on the on the board. We have done a good job. It's just this year, I think we're going to get a lot more pressures. Right. I'm just saying and that it's, because of that, though, yeah. it's it makes it harder to be it like, does. oh, we're just going to cut this program, which we just really wanted and thought we could afford, but we don't really. It's like there's not a lot of that kind of stuff yeah, in our budget. Yeah, I don't think you don't have that much there. No, that's that, that there's not a lot of fluff left in it. We found it all. Mm -hmm. That's how no. we kept the, the percentages low for so many years. Exactly. Yeah, but if just, we could get the school side to do that, it would. Yeah, it would help a lot. So just as a little, for, if we had it, just two percent brandless growth, we're talking at nearly ninety thousand dollars of more money coming in. So that two fifty becomes one sixty, just. So for example, that's why I want to continue moving forward with the Branchwood yeah. project because the Branchwood project is worth a lot of economic growth yeah. and grand list value. So yeah. I don't want to, you know, 
Mm -hmm. You know, been waiting for Salisbury Square to materialize. You know, those kind of things need to happen. So, yeah. So yeah, we all got you know, you get the wind taken out of your sails here during the pandemic, but it's time to, you know, try to push this stuff along and move forward here to find those kind of growth areas. Two percent at a time. Going back to when I was in Essex, we'd have described that as anemic. <laughs> Oh, I know. <laughs> we described it as what? Anemic. Anemic. Just it's how That's times not, and places yeah. change, yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, yikes. All right. <coughs> Let's move on to discuss the town ARPA list. <laughs> kind of connected. Kind of connected. So we've done a couple of different things throughout the ARPA process. One was create the committee, create a scope of work. The idea there was, in no small part, public engagement, solicit projects through some sort of public avenue, make recommendations to you after some review. The committee's working pretty hard at that. They've been underway for a while now. They've taken in a few, still probably first round of submission is the maybe the broadest way to describe Yeah, first round of submissions are 24 months. Yeah. And so they're working on that process at the same time there was always the idea that there'd be a town list that would fit in there as well. And um, so the idea is to try to talk about some of the projects that you might envision as part of that town list and then we can start to run down details, costs, those types of things. One that's come up a few times internally, externally, um, and it ties into pandemic resilience is website upgrade, e-commerce capacity expansions and digitization of records. Um, so that's one of those ones that I just need some costs to sign, but it's a few different departments so that if we had to close our doors unexpectedly, we could still process the bulk of the business and provide a level of access to, to anybody with those means. And are there, were there greater sort of labor efficiencies in, embedded in that as well if we had these kinds of procedure processes in place that things Potentially. would require less staff time and stuff like that? It may cut down, for example, on <coughs> trips to the window, um, especially if it were integrated with recreation um, registration, some of which, a lot of which already happen online anyway. Um, uh, if you could somehow do dog licensing that way. Um, tax payments were easier to do, water and sewer payments were easier to do, it was easier to do rep, uh, records research. Um, Mm -hmm. Some of the things you'd still have to do at the window, just because you need proof of who you are, so and that needs to be notarized, things that have to be recorded so that fees can be calculated mm -hmm. based on the size so, of the thing. So a lot of this would be affecting the, the clerk treasurer office more than the rest of the I think in offices. finance, and then really it's, um, from an internal impact, it can create some efficiencies and some you know, 21st century good governance stuff on that end. But this is really an upgrade for... Um, for the public and anybody who's a user of the building who, because these are tools that would be there in a pandemic, they'd also be there if for some reason people are sick, people are out, you know, records research can continue because we've digitized those pieces. Um, mm -hmm. and we don't necessarily need to maintain some space up there, so maybe we can reallocate the spaces in the back. Um, I don't know if they have a, a higher purpose, but we'd at least be able to figure out if that is the case, you know. Can copying equipment go there rather than in a kitchenette? Um, so, so there are those. And then the other ones that have come up along the way have been sort of energy related, everything from EV charging stations to any kind of solar installations. We've talked a little bit about um, water quality projects for one that we're going back to sort of the original eligibility for the use of funds. Um, and the way we've talked about that, that's a good way to spread the money to the different corners of Randolph because water quality projects that we have that touch all the corners, stormwater is a big one. Um, so when you think of like the projects we did on Howard Hill through the grants and aid, we've got some road sections out, you know, North Randolph headed into East Randolph. Those are ones that would be prime for that and get that money to different spots. Um, there's been a little bit of talk about bike ped stuff. Um, but nothing project-centric other than maybe it helps us with some of those. We've talked about the missing links um, or the connector pieces. We could really benefit from someone who could come through, do an assessment, and essentially hand us a maintenance plan. Um, we've been good at building sidewalks. We're a little up and down with what happens after they're built. Um, so, the, I mean, those are just some very broad ideas, things that have come up 
when you all have talked in the past or just that have come up internally, but really it's about are there ideas or are there things based on sort of the budget con and this might be an iterative process for you too, um, as you see what happens with the budget, but the things that we could embed in there. We've stayed away from projects that have identified funding sources through other mechanisms, so paving projects, there's the reserve, there was a year-end surplus that voters had put a chunk of it into the paving reserve. That was a nice little turbo boost to that. Um, and then it's got consistent funding, so we've stayed away from those types of uh, projects that other committees have done. Um, and then have stayed away from the North Reservoir and Well Project um, to sort of reflect that it, there's service to the Enterprise District there. And the goal has always been how is the can you make the case that the impact is as broad as possible? Um, and does that one sort of fit there? Well, there's certainly some funding issues with that project based on, on the construction cost. But we've got identified potential avenues to go and get it. Um, so if you don't use ARPA funds, there are pathways. So some of those, those are the bigger dollar ones that we have kind of in a, in a capital programming frame of mind. And then we have money going aside for just gravel road improvement, those types of things. Um, just in looking at what other towns are using, it's a real mixed bag. Some are, are taking requests as they come in. They might be community project focused um, on Pillars planning to use some of it on one of their larger projects they've got planned or on. I forget if East State Street or another one. That's a water, sewer, stormwater. Sidewalk paving, ball of joy, um, a very mm -hmm. expensive project. So, I think there's benefits to looking at going like with the digitized records and e-commerce side. I mean, that definitely meets in with the resilience. The goal of the funding. It's also something that we're never going to do. It's never going to reach the top of the list, but yeah. it's something that we should do. Yeah. Uh, but that's that's not that's like other records. That's not like your land records and and all that stuff, right? Because we get revenue from that too. Right, and it would be the idea would be to to essentially charge the fees as if you came in and did the research and made the copies and. And I think there are, programmatically, there are ways to do that, whether it be subscription fee with a true up or something as a per record basis. Yeah. That's why New Hampshire does it. Yeah. I, there are a couple of communities that have that. I'm, I, we can reach out to them. I want to say Colchester has been doing this for a while. Yep. I could be getting it wrong, but I'm pretty sure. Well, that would be good, too, if yeah. you can get those on there. But I just don't want to see it impact the revenue side. No. We need that, so. <laughs> <laughs> and so those are those um, those projects are coming to the board, and then the list from the committee it, for the the it, board to decide what to fund. Yeah, it'd be nice to somehow maybe marry them together a little bit before that, just so that everything melds. There's a chance to review it to see how the things fit together. Um, but timing may dictate if they meet here or at sort of a committee level. But the hope is that we can join them up earlier, especially since the committee's really been living in sort of the rules, the considerations, um, you know, take advantage of the time and energy that's been put into it. What type of projects are you seeing coming in that? Uh, there's a variety. Um, some infrastructure stuff, uh, water system improvements, um, um, Town beautification, um, some recreation related things, um, improved rec facilities. Um, some things are, uh, oh, there's paving in here. Um, I can tell you the committee, just generally as a committee, we were, we were tr trying to encourage projects that, that aren't things that would normally be funded by general fund stuff. Something that sort of takes this one time pot of money and moves the town forward in a way that otherwise wouldn't happen. But people are submitting things for things like paving, and so, um, you know, <laughs> what do we know? Um, 
uh, some. Um, let's see if I can get uh, yeah, a fair amount of recreational stuff. Solar, solar, charging facilities. Um, youth and community center mm. gives you a flavor of things. Mm -hmm. Child care center. <clears throat> I just and did so another that's in, order. in terms of the cost, yeah. some of these projects are a little suggestions like 10, 10, 10 to $50,000 and some are more than $300,000. So it's it's quite a range. And what we've asked people to do is, um, take it only takes about five minutes or so to, to submit a, a project here. And then we are going to rank them in, we're taking, what we've said is we will take uh, these submittals through the end of the year. In January we'll rank them and we have sort of four criteria that we're, we're looking at. Um, uh, and then we'll, we'll get, pass them on to you, uh, these projects, and how, how they score and what we recommend. And um, it's obviously up, up to you uh, to, to take the recommendations or not. You can do what you, what, what you want. There's, um, the criteria that we are looking at that we've decided is important is one is the connection to the intent of the funding in terms of resiliency and, and how the town um, benefits in the event of another pandemic or something similar. Second thing is community benefit, how widespread are the benefits is it, um, in terms of geographic reach and, and um, demographic reach. Um, so that's connection to the intent of funding, the community benefit. Um, next thing is the project viability. Like somebody, if somebody comes up with a great idea but it's sort of pie in the sky, mm -hmm. probably it's going to rank pretty low because it's just not going to get done. Mm -hmm. So when we look at that, we look at, you know, has there been a conceptual plan done already? Has there already been some investigation done? Are there people who can be champions and managers of the project available? So we look at sort of project viability, that's our third criteria. Fourth thing is connection to economic growth. How does it benefit the town um, long term? Does it avoid creating um, uh, future financial obligations for the town? Um, does it leverage additional funds? Can it be used, for instance, as match money for something for another project that's already being funded. So those are the four, four things. We have sub-criteria under each one of those, but again, those are the four things. Connection to the original intent of the funding, project viability, um, I'm sorry, community benefit, uh, and connection to economic growth. Those are the four ways that we decided, the four buckets that we're looking at. So when we give them, give you the recommendations, we'll have scoring in those four categories. So from the committee perspective, would you like the, the list of the town projects? to score along with the ones coming in from the public? I think that would be the cleanest, but it, I mean, in the course of an hour or so talking to Trevor and Kim, we could put it into this matrix and score them the same way, I don't think. Mm -hmm. uh, ideally, they're not going to submit a, a sheet for each one. Probably. Well, we no, but we could sit down. And <laughs> we already talked about that. Yeah. Well, we, we make a table yeah. that would provide mm -hmm. sort of a description. It wouldn't look probably terribly different than the scoring sheet even, where it's what's the project. <clears throat> We might identify right. sort yeah. of what set of <clears throat> policy goals we're aiming to hit, mm -hmm. and then order of magnitude for cost, and then timeline. And some of the, not the trick, but really it is identifying the projects, coming up with those cost estimates. Those are the, the two pieces of labor that go with it. And the cost estimates one is the one that we'll have to run down and do the best we can to at least ballpark them accurately enough. One um, one project that came to my mind recently, one that's been talked about a lot for for many years now, uh, that I, which is another one which would be like, we'd love to do, but we never, you know, kind of would love to do, but there's never enough money for, is um, is putting in a um, a multi-use path between Randolph downtown and, and Bethel along the river, and. Um, Originally, I thought maybe this would this that would be a good um, project to um, to use some ARPA money for planning purposes to kind of get that ball rolling. And then, my understanding is that there's there's a lot of money um, out there for those kinds of projects that is non ARPA money, um, and that granting agencies um, are looking for this these kinds of projects um, in in a bigger sense. And so, did they maybe double the Vorak grant money? The Vorak money got. I think it was way more than double. And it's way more double, right? Yeah. I and mean, that's where that would qualify. Yeah. I, th I think it's there, but I think, I think there's other places, too. You can get a transportation too, planning just, grant, too. Right. So, yeah. um, to do the planning work and then go for the BOR Act. So, so anyway, that, that was one, one thought that I had that I, I would like, I'd really like to see us, this is a, would be a multi-year 
process of you know planning, getting funding, and doing construction. And um, I think it's something that we should start you know kind of getting the ball rolling on some sometime sometime soon. Start talking to people in Bethel and see if if they they would be on board with you know doing their end of of things and, and working together to to do it. It would have clear economic development impacts. Um, people would come from all over the place to go on a flat, mostly multi-youth, multi-use path between the, through nature, right? Through absolutely, you know, away from cars in a protected area where it's flat. Yeah. You can go biking on trails around here, but good luck going more than a couple of miles before on you flat. hit a hill. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so it would be great for people with young families. It would be great for older people. It would really um, mm -hmm. be. And, and again, this is all, these aren't my ideas. This is something that people have been talking about in the community for. A very oh, long time now. And it's been talked about for years. We've been doing a lot of the sort of the easier projects in terms of paths and stuff like that. But this would, given our experience with all that other stuff, um, it seems like the, the community is really ready now to do a, a, something of this magnitude. And um, I think we could easily develop a lot of good relationships with various groups and other communities and get yeah, a lot of momentum. Doesn't right, Two Rivers right provide won't two rivers help with that type of thing? I think when we were talking about yeah. the sidewalks in Randolph Center, I don't if I remember right, Peter Gregory said they have somebody on staff that'll help write the grant to go through and get the transportation planning grant for it, and then they'll staff it and do that study that you're talking about. Basically, look look at what the mm -hmm. what it would look like, and you know the town of Randolph and the town of Bethel could both sponsor it. And, yeah. I'd let them do the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, no. They love those grants because it pays for their staff. Right. And yet, truthfully, you don't have that many landowners that have to deal with it going down through there either. I mean, it's not like it's all chopped up. There's not a ton, but no, there's but there's, there's, but there's, there's few big ones who big would ones. need to be persuaded yeah, well, um, for it to be might, viable. You might be able to persuade, it, persuade them with some form of tax benefit. You so. know? I mean, that's always been the... And that was one of the vastest strategies years ago, which you know, could never seem to get across the table, was that you know people who you let people use a snowmobile trail should have some form of tax benefit to that. It hasn't happened, but because it voids the recreation yeah. law that holds you harmless. <laughs> yeah, I know there's a problem with it, but it seems like it could get worked out somewhere in the legislature. So would would it make sense to approach um, Two Rivers about this mm -hmm. first she before like? Because having having a path that goes to the Randolph line and back would yeah. probably be nice, but it's not quite as compelling as one that goes all the way to. No, the one that's so it's no different than people kayaking down the river right now. You park your car here, somebody parks the car down there, and you kayak down the river. Yeah, it's the same kind of so, thing, you know. So, well, I guess what I'm, I'm what I'm wanting to know is from from a process point of view, is this something that we should like? Start to team with folks in Bethel first, and then talk to Two Rivers if if I'd they call seem two rivers, like they're interested. They'll pull the, they bring I would call and them. talk to Two Rivers and let them pull the meeting together mm -hmm. with Randolph and Bethel yeah. and have that conversation. So talk, so so, so talk to I two. Was that one call of your, Peter and be like, hey. So Matt, was that kind of was that one of those things on the list? Was a no, recreational path of list. that magnitude? Um, no, it's not. On I don't okay. think that's the right funding. And that's kind of like, yeah. in terms of the criteria that we've established, that's a project that would, that would um, score, I think, very, very well until you get to um, uh, sort of viability only because it's so far off. It's not that it's, it's um, undoable. It's a good project. We can clearly do it, yeah. but it just has a, such a long horizon for getting it built that it, to getting it, constructed. it might score relatively low there, but the other thing is it would score really high. You got yeah. nobody managing it. You got no project outline. You've got right, no, right. You got a long ways to go before you get nothing. to that point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I and mean, actually, Larry and I talked about that project. I mean, like a project like that, if, if even if we put together a very conceptual plan showing possible routes or something, it moves the project a little bit further along, and, and that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we also talked about that's an example of a project that may have plenty of other funding available. Uh, I mean, municipalities all over the state have been getting transportation planning grants to do to do bike paths. We just haven't. Locally. Yeah, I and think it's a Peter Gregory discussion. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Let him put together. And and I Th those I those grants, though, I believe have matching requirements. Um, if I remember right, from the last time I worked on one of those, and that, that would be it would be an excellent use to you know, apply it to the match. Yep. Put that on your put that on your town list. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and um, and I I I. Um, mentioned this to uh, to Mark the other day, and he said that there's um, 
TAP money as a grant? Is that? And I don't, but I don't know what that stands for. But it's a, it's a, it's something that which is open right now. There's a program that's open right now that we, you, the league put out something that we're not, you may not be eligible for it in the municipality. It may be a different program. Though. He, or maybe it's, I don't know. I. It's a familiar he, acronym. He, do, he doesn't. He doesn't. <laughs> Oh, transportation alternatives oh, program. Yeah, it is a it's a V Trans program. That's the same one. Is that the same thing that yeah. you were talking about? Yep. Okay. We're not eligible for COVID nineteen related paid paid leave grants. That was what it was. Um, but again, you're thinking that this is something that would be more appropriate to to run through two rivers than to try to. I would. They'll staff it. They'll do everything. They'll write the grant application. They'll get Bethel on board with us. They'll start a committee to oversee the study and. Okay. Well, I can certainly I get would. in touch with Peter Gregory. And I think that's their role. Tell him that yeah. we're that we're interested in. In seeing where this might go and see what he says. Yeah. The problem is we just don't have the staff here to. That's going to take some energy mm -hmm. and a consultant, and there'll be some engineering to it. There'll be some, you know, mm -hmm. wetland delineation, that kind of work to stay away from that. Where does the path go? Railroad goes down through there. You know, some challenges there. All right. Sounds like we've got direction there. Jetter financing proposal. We kept it on in case we were ready to go. We've got the down payment or the deposit was paid using wastewater reserves, so it's our machine and it's being built. We still have to work out the financing proposal. We're trying to get something from municipal lease consultants out of Grand Isle. I just haven't yet, so we've got to follow up with them. So it's really just finding out about that. We've programmed it into the budget, assuming minus the deposit, what it would be, similar interest rate to the loader. And that seems to be where they are, so in the 6.5% range. So we've got that for the five-year term. So we are planning for that debt service payment one way or the other. We just have to work out exactly where we finance it from. And the options right now, one called Great Western. That's what the um, equipment vendor provided. But it would be nice to work a little more locally with someone. <coughs> Sure. So we're still working on it. I All kept right. it on there in case we were ready to, to ask you to take action. Is there any other business? Um, I, I had a quick question, and I don't know whether you were going to cover this in the manager's report because I didn't take a look at it. Do, do we have any update on the animal um, cruelty case that occurred up at the mobile home park? Armstrong. Do we know if that's being pursued for prosecution? I believe so, yeah. That, that's really the update. Yeah, yep. yeah. And the, would that be a combination of Milo and the state police, presumably? I, I think usually these have been the state police. I guess the game wardens have taken over a lot of the investigative response mm -hmm. work. It was a short-term MOU type of arrangement that looks like it's going to extend out. And so it's really been more of the game warden working with the county the state's attorney, yeah. and the, the one dog passed away. The other one, I think, has even it's been rehabilitated, if not physically. Yeah, the last it's I heard, yeah. it was foster. I don't know if it's been rehomed, yeah, re but it yeah. was good. Mm -hmm. I mean, they got the dog back up to 85 pounds, yeah, yeah. from 35 pounds. And that's pretty just, I, I just I, I'm concerned because it's now the third, just in my tenure on. Select board is the third sort of manual. The other two weren't animal cruelty; they were, you know, vicious animal issues. Mm -hmm. But um, it just feels like something we need to get a better mm -hmm. handle on. That's one of the most horrific um, situations I've heard of. And, yeah. I mean, whether there's you know emotional illness, or mental illness, or whatever component, it's still it's just stuff. Mm -hmm. And how we could ever have, you know, I don't know how we ever could have known what was going on there, but. Um, I hope that um, the courts in this state, and, and it's something that I know Jay is, is, is looking into at the legislative level, and the courts in this state, we do an awful job uh, in this state of, of um, animal cruelty uh, intervention. We really do, and, and I, I just, 
I want to follow this one because it's just it's so horrific. And I don't know whether there's anything we can do at the state level to tighten up, um, tighten up our animal. The courts just dismiss these things so so cavalierly, um, and you know, behind every animal abuser is a child abuser and a spousal abuser, and you know. Yeah. But there is there's a, a whole legislative package coming. Good. On that, that was part overdue. of the march and the mm -hmm. stuff that took place in Montpelier last week. I think. Yeah. We had another incident that might head to prosecution too, not involving dogs, but pigs mm -hmm. actually. So there's mm -hmm. there are a couple of different ones in play, but it seems like the combination of Milo and the game warden and the yeah. state's attorney has. I have to touch. There's been some action on these sooner than later. I, um, I so. would like to follow that closely. Mm -hmm. Any other other business? We do have a request from Sonny to appoint a select board rep on the planning commission. Because somebody resigned from the planning commission. Oh yeah. <laughs> That'd be me. His request was for Larry. <laughs> 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 okay, I don't see how I can say no. I will You've been requested. Have to do that unless, yeah. unless uh, if somebody else is really itching for it, I, I'll mm -hmm. arm wrestle you over it. But, is that um, something you want, Pat? <laughs> oh, he's muted. That's why we have it. He's actually not muted. Just he's not muted. Him. He's just not talking. Hmm. <laughs> he's not volunteering. <laughs> well. I would, I would take the place, but I'm already doing TDRB. I'm just waiting for something, to, the DRB, I'm just waiting for something to come before them. I was talking to Chris Recky the other day, and it's been a while since there's been anything on there. Which and, uh, feeds to the grand list issue, which... Yeah. <laughs> That's absolutely right. All right. Manager's report. Nothing much to add from what you have there. Um, other than with the staffing, by the time we hit Christmas, we'll be down to just the finance director's role in terms of the vacancies. Well, that's very impressive. This is the closest we've been to a full set. What, if, what about the um, rec director as assistant? Do we have like a part-time? We do have some part-time hours that are in there. Um, I know Paige has talked to a few different candidates and options, so we could add that. Um, there is some 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 help we could use there. But in terms of the full-time positions, longer sort of impact. Um, and we did, we had three scheduled. We held two interviews for finance director, and we'll probably bring both to a next round. Um, That's very good news. So it's looking good. more positive than not. I'm trying to be very serious. I don't want to jinx it. Like, we've been close yeah. before. Yeah. <laughs> we had the fish on the line in the boat and somehow. <laughs> And in the cooler. Uh, yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, executive session. There are three contracts, Excuse personnel me. appointment of an, an or evaluation of a public official and legal or potential legal. One's really just sort of an update the legal piece. Um, yep. Or once they go, once they make the motion. All right. And I'll oh, make the right. motion too. So you got to do you two. You got to find that the find that it's necessary. necessary. Oh, did we do that? That's yeah. it. That's the first. Oh motion. yeah, yeah, okay. Are you making that motion? Sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll make that motion. <laughs> All those in favor. Hi. Hi. And now the motion to go into. There you go. Now session. I'll move to go into executive session. Second. All those in favor. Aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion carries. <gasps> well, that's the end. Yeah.